I was right. wondering where we're at. So we're going to do the uh, second half of this survival analysis. If any can remember even how that works at this point. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we're uh, on like the qu the questions and uh, yeah. you know discussion. Yeah. Right. So, did anyone have any questions or do any of the exercises at all, or want to talk about any particular one? Um, actually, let me just I actually, the book. sorry, went through the lab. I did. I confess, I did not get to the exercises. Um, it seemed pretty straightforward, at least a tutorial, and just fitting the different, you know, like. Uh, models i do have a question and it's a dumb question so can i just get it out of the way um yes okay let me show you my, that's what we're here for <laughs> <laughs> my screen because <laughs> um, you may think it's a dumb question yeah probably no it is okay we so, also don't have any idea <laughs> this is one of the first uh, chunk four i guess over here um and they're fitting you know the uh survival fit sir um, sorry, chunk for you. Yeah, got it. So I get this um, serve fit parentheses survival time and status and then tilde one. Yeah. What is this one? Yeah. That, that just means only fit the intercept. I mean, it's kind of, I guess survive fit can do more okay. than just. Um, okay. It can do more than just, a, well, if you, if you put it, if you put a, a predictor in, it'll plot multiple sure. curves, which I think is actually. Mm -hmm. The next thing, right? So yeah. <laughs> the next thing, the next chunk. So yeah. in this case, it just fits one curve, essentially. It just fits one of the intercept. It just does a standard Kaplan-Meier curve in that case. The, the text says something about this. This is how you tell it to do this kind of thing. It points it out that that's kind of weird, but. OK, because I got that, you know, when they're sort of like doing tilde and then dot for all of the predictors or specific. Yeah, one just means intercept fine. only. Yeah. OK, that helps. Minus one, I think, means don't fit an intercept because otherwise it almost automatically does, right? But is that right? Is it minus one? I can't remember now. Actually, I'm not sure. What's minus one? Sorry. There's a way to tell it not to fit an intercept too. Don't fit an intercept at all oh. for these oh. formulas. Anyway, that's just an aside. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the the dotted so not a dumb uh, question, lines are I think the confidence intervals or what is that like uh, variance? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think those yeah, are confidence error. error. Okay. I'm not sure whether there's standard error or 95 percent or what. I think if there's options and that might be a, there might be a default. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see what okay. it says. That was my one okay, question. Why doesn't that work? Yeah, definitely not a dumb question. Um, oh, okay, good. Because I, I went through the whole thing and I was still like, okay, I, I see what other mm -hmm. things do, but I don't see what the one does. So, okay. mm -hmm. so. I'll yeah. stop sharing. Um, so you guys go ahead. Yeah, I, so on my end, I actually, um, I did a bunch of stuff at work, uh, actually, uh, using what we learned, because uh, oh, nice. I had a situation that came up um, mm -hmm. and I came across some neat, neat like packages and some questions and a lot of different things. So I could talk about that. Um, yeah, that'd be great. I was doing yeah, um, do that. Okay. I was, so I was using the uh, Cox like proportional hazards um, model. Uh, so essentially um, it was actually a situation where we have uh, interval censoring are you guys, did they talk about interval censoring in the book? Uh, I think they probably did, but I forget. They mentioned it, but they only, they only mentioned it, but it, they didn't, uh, didn't go over to any, basically they just okay. mentioned that it exists. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me, let me share my screen. Uh, I'm not going to be able to like talk cool. directly about what I, the, the data, but um, mm -hmm. let me just show it, show an image here. Of course. Yeah. All right, cool. So, so it's like, uh, yeah, so it's a situation where I don't know if that's a great plot. Um, let me, maybe this one's better. Let's see what this image looks like. One second. Uh, let's see if I can zoom in. 
Um, that's not a great plot either. Um, let's see. There's a better. These are all like. Huh, a lot of these are actually right censored. It's kind of a, these are weird plots. Um, anyway, uh, I was gonna like draw it, but uh, I think it's probably easiest. But it's I, my iPad. I can't find my iPad's um, pencil, so I'll just talk about it. Um, so anyway, I have a situation. I have a situation where um, like we have some metric um, that like we're interested in, but we only know that it exists in an interval where the interval is zero to this maximum amount. Um, so it's kind of like, uh, I was trying to think of, a, of a, just a generic example. Um, like if, if, a, if like a kid was going in for checkups, right? Um, and, and the doctor was recording, like, did they lose any teeth, right? And, um, and it's like time to lose, like if you're modeling, let's say time to lose a tooth, right? And, um, and you know, you know, the, the last time you saw them, they had this tooth. And then, you know, this time you saw them, they didn't have a tooth. And if you're interested in um, kind of the, the time that it took to, for that tooth to fall out, right? The time of survival of that tooth, then you don't have the exact number. Let's say assume that the kid doesn't know when the tooth fell out, right? Um, like you have the interval in which it, it occurred. And maybe for some kids, you see them every month. For some, you see them, you know, every three months or they miss an appointment or whatever. And so you have like kind of different interval lengths, but you know that the the that real number that you're after is like less than the, the upper end of that interval. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is a situation. And then in my case, I also had uh, multiple observations per person or per like, uh, 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 yeah, like unit. So like, let's say you had like a kid coming in at time zero and then, um, you know, and then you have coming in the same kid coming in again, at time one, time two, time three, time four. And like up until that last time slot or that last appointment, they had that tooth so it was so the tooth was still there it's still alive right the tooth was still in their mouth like in the first second and third appointment and then the fourth appointment it fell out sometime before the fourth appointment um so that's like essentially the situation and with the cox proportional hazards model you can you you can you can um cluster variances like at the unit level at the like the person or id level or whatever your unit of observation is um and you can have like both static like predictors so like something that's about a person that like doesn't change or you could have uh also in addition to that uh predictors that change with respect to time as well um so it's pretty neat and like i did a ton of reading i was like there's got to be like, like, okay, we learned about Cox proportional hazards. Like there's gotta be something that like, is like an ML version of it or like something that seems like, you know, like other variations on this um, idea. And what I found out, like at least so far in my research is that uh, it's really kind of like what people use the Cox proportional hazards for this particular type of situation where you have like repeated observations per individual. And um, you have like, this like scenario where you have like a time one and time two, and you know, in between that time is when your event happened or, or didn't happen. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so that was like the first thing I guess I found. Um, and like, there's a lot of like, so like there's things that are like, uh, like I found survival force us um, is like a machine learning um, kind of approach. I don't think they talked about this in the book, but um a lot of these, pretty much all these methods are, uh, this is second learn, but um, it exists in R as well. Um, the, the thing I found is like all, pretty much all of these ML methods are for cases where uh, you have right censoring. Um, and they didn't really, there isn't like a, like I found some like posts where people are saying, oh, you could just like modify this like loss function to deal with your particular type of censoring, but I don't. I, I don't understand like how to do that at, at this point, but, um, but like pretty much everything that's out there is like geared towards right censoring, which I, which makes sense. I think it's probably the most common 
kind of censoring. You know, you have like a bunch of individuals that like, or or whatever, where you're looking at that like have complete data. You know, when they when they um uh when they had an event. And then, and then you have a bunch of people who are still going and you don't know when their events going to be. And, um, and so like a lot of these are, are kind of made toward, made for that. Um, and pretty much everything I've found so far. Um, and I posted in the chat, uh, this, uh, graphic and I wanted to just show this these slides here because I thought it was really interesting. Um, yes, yeah, so this is better. So these are better here. Uh, Oh yeah, so I thought this was really cool. Um, let me just zoom out for a second. Um, so there, it's just like summarizing the different kinds of uh, um, survival analysis methods. Um, and so you have like Cox regression here. Um, I did look into it, like they have like a Cox boost, uh, I guess some like kind of gradient boosted Cox regression um that i don't fully get yet or kind of how that works but um but they kind of color also by semi-parametric parametric and non-parametric but that, that was kind of cool um and here's all the ml stuff so like survival trees um uh you know i guess you can use all these different methods for survival analysis which you know i'd be interested in learning more like how can you use you know, uh, like, like, I don't know, a Bayesian network for survival analysis or an AEP is I'm not um, totally sure yet. Um, but I thought this was like a cool, like map of the landscape uh, survival analysis. Um, yeah. Would you mind putting the link in the chat, Kevin? Yeah, it's actually in our uh, Slack channel, the ISL. I got it, okay. Uh, it's just like the thing above what John posted oh, or see. Two, two posts ago. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, so it's interesting, like it feels yeah. like, um, feels like for the right censored case, there's a lot already out there for, um, kind of ML versions of these traditional survival, like contexts or, or problems. Um, but yeah, I guess I was kind of surprised that, that for these other kind of variations of, of different kinds of censoring, there doesn't seem to be a lot, whole lot out there. Um, so people are just basically like, if you have this situation, use use Cox proportional hazards uh, regression. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so and the other thing kind of I was, I was also looking into or thinking about a little bit was um, while I was on this was like performance evaluation. So I'm not sure if they talk about that that much in the chapter. I don't remember seeing a lot of it. Um, um, I don't know. Do you guys remember like evaluating performance of a, like for instance, like a proportional hazards model? Wow. So I, they did I, that I, simulated I, data thing in the lab. Did that? Do they talk about performance from that point of view? Um. Yeah, like you said, I don't think yeah. there's a lot if they did. Mm -mm. Yeah, um, but what I what I found there was that a, one really common way to evaluate is concordance index, um, which is, and the nice thing about it is that it's you basically interpret it the same way you do as a, uh, a area under the curve uh, kind of uh, metric, um, but it's specifically for like sensor data. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so I guess it, it's, I need to look at this again, but it, I think it's some, so it, se it seems like it's some kind of um, kind of correlation between when the model predicted uh, like uh, an event versus like like the relative like offset or rank of, of that actual event, some, something like that. So like- Oh, the book does talk about that very briefly. Uh, like, oh, I, did, okay. I kind of brushed through that myself because I didn't really understand that section to tell you the truth. Yeah, yeah. There's but like it's a, page, a really a page on that. Yeah, so it's a yeah, NJ is the risk score of the unit I. Yeah, I need to look at this again. Um, but but I mean the nice thing and the thing I really liked about it is that you you can interpret it and it's like meant to be kind of similar interpretation to this area under the curve where 0.5 is a random prediction, one is a perfect um, model. 
Um, so anyway, so I was, I was like kind of looking at what I was doing at work and I found this metric and I was, and it was like spitting out, like it was slightly better than uh, chance. Right. But it was like 0.56 or something. Um, so uh, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't like that, that useful, I guess, or that much better than, than random chance. Um, but, uh, mm. but yeah, but, um, yeah, so, so that was the, kind of the other thing I was thinking about a lot, which was, uh, yeah, a, net, a performance of these models and, um, you can't really evaluate them the same thing with the same way with the censorship. Um, so the C index, I guess, is a good way to, uh, account for, the censored sensor data um yeah the, the book does talk about that in section 11.71 like i said it's like basically one page worth and he goes through it pretty quickly mm -hmm. but it does talk okay. about yeah the c concordance index the herald's c index and yeah maybe this would be a good blog post to read i, I need to read about it a little bit more i just basically found it started interpreting it because cool. we kind of know how to interpret it but um um, but, uh, I, I, I want to actually had an application for this stuff. <laughs> right yeah. On. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was interesting. Cause I think there could be a lot of the situations with interval censoring where you have some kind of like inexact metric, right. And you know, that it's for sure within this window, but you don't know where it falls kind of in that, in that period. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's super useful. I think for that, that kind of situation um and i wanted to show another thing one more thing but you guys can interrupt me whenever so if, uh you no, like cool. um so the other part of this was like uh i was kind of longing for a little bit more in terms of visualization for these survival uh analyses like with for instance the cox proportional hazards like results and visualizing these kaplan meyer um curves and this package i found it was really nice in many ways. So this uh, serve minor, um, and yeah, I did mention that during the first session. Oh, you did. Okay, the okay serve cool. minor thing. Yeah, I gave a good um, example of that. Actually, it wasn't awesome. my source. It was actually from the original notes. I just left it in there. I did talk about that briefly. Okay, uh, sorry, pretty I cool about stuff. That. Um, yeah, it's it is it's really useful. Those notes um, are up, by the way. I'm sorry to interrupt again, but okay, those notes yeah. are up now. They've been they've been pulled and or yeah, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. cool. merged. Thanks. To say. Thanks. Um, so you can you know it'll take the the Cox pH model objects um, and either automatically kind of uh, do grouped um survival curves or uh if you supply it with like a strata argument for one of with one of the predictors it uh will automatically plot that um and yeah and you can like choose different ways of aggregating um across those groups like in terms of these uh um because like let's say you have like three covariates and you're just you're just showing kind of one one of them you know the differences in the curves and one of those covariates like you can aggregate in different ways um, for each of those curves. And so it gives you flexibility in doing that. Um, a couple Wait, of things that do? Um, so I think it like, I think it estimates like a different model for each level of this, this, um, this variable. Uh, let me, let me double check. Um, I thought I'd do that without this. You need to just put anything over there. Um, let's see. Yeah, identify stratification variables. It says it's identical to interaction function. Um, don't really get that. It's only one variable. Hmm. Uh, let's see if anyone else is better. Stratify models. Oh, I see. It, it it defines a separate baseline hazard function for each level uh, of the stratification variable. Oh, uh, okay. That's different than just mm -hmm. doing an ordinary mm -hmm. hazard fit then. 
Yeah. Of course, my answer should. Yeah, I didn't really That's do much new. of that. Hmm. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, I did play a little bit around with like interaction and things like that. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I also found like, so like I, I was, once you get the model, I was think like, aside from like curves like this, if you, um, like I, I wanted to kind of plot them myself in some cases, cause I had like, I don't know, I wanted to see a certain range of time or like um, uh, certain levels of like, some continuous variables so like the, you you have to kind of make some choices to visualize if like you want to see you know the effect of like a continuous covariate um or predictor um mm -hmm. so you have to like either for this for this library you have to like uh des uh make it discrete right like, like make it into quantiles or something and plot the different levels of those quantiles and then have it you have different curve for each level um uh of that um but Anyway, so I, I started doing, trying to play around with things like where you like, like you have the fitted like function uh, or some fitted model and you, you know, create a, a set of data that a new data frame that like uh, is represents kind of the range you're interested in understanding, like what is the survival of like, you know, uh, along the, the range of this like predicted survival uh, function for like the range of these covariates, for instance. Um, and so I ended up doing things like, like kind of creating the new data, like uh, predicting based on that survival fit object. Yes. Um, and then it, um, yeah. And then you kind of get, can get uh, survival curves for each kind of combination of those covariates. Um, so yeah, the one interesting thing I found about this library that was kind of frustrating are two things. Uh, one was that it doesn't work with tibbles. Um, so if you supply it with like a tibble, it'll, uh, it'll complain about something that doesn't make any sense. Um, and then if you for, uh, coerce it, coerce it into a data frame, it works fine. Um, so I think actually specifically, if you do one of these plots where there's just one line, if you don't specify any sort of grouping, it'll work fine with the tibble. And then as soon as you start like adding like, uh, different levels or, you know, uh, uh, like, like, yeah, like here, if you have a strata or um, I think you can write the variable in manually. Yeah, here, like variable equals Rx, it'll like error out, um, which is really odd. I, I, there, I, I was looking at the GitHub for this library. Um, uh, serve my GitHub. Um, and there are, a lot of issues. Uh, so I think one hand, a lot of people use it. And on the other hand, there's a lot of issues with it. <laughs> uh, a lot of like challenges with it. And so like here, this one, it's like Tibble, um, Tibble issue. Um, there's a bunch, I think that reference that same thing. Um, so I, like, I, I was like trying to figure out what was producing this error for a really long time. And then it like, it, it you know I couldn't figure it out forever and then I, and then I found you know on these forums here on GitHub that it was a um, it was a, a the object type was a problem which is kind of annoying um, and then uh, the other thing I found with this library that was interesting or made it slightly unusable was that it uses up a lot of memory for some reason when you try to plot some of these things. Like if you have a decent amount of data and uh, you try to plot like, you know, like uh, maybe a variable of like five levels or there's this other uh, function that's like a facet function um, where you can plot like combinations of levels across, you know, like it looks really nice like in these examples. But when I tried to do that, uh, in my case, it like it said could not allocate 127 gigabytes of memory. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, like this is wow, this is terrible. Uh, so I don't know what it's doing behind the scenes, but but that's when I started. That's when I was like, all right, I'm just going to create my own new data object, do uh, sur the serve fit you know function on my Cox PH model. Um, and uh and pass it new data and you know generate those curves myself so and like that's not that 
hard to do. So I, I, I just uh, like these, these are a nice package, but like, I just don't, um, I, it was frustrating to like have those issues that I ran into um, like that. So, and maybe it's meant for data that's like only a few thousand observations. Like I was like, mo like I think what I was using was maybe 20,000 observations. So there might be kind of some logic in it that doesn't scale well, I'm, I'm not really sure, but. Um, but yeah, that was kind of my, uh, my exploration here. Um, oh yeah, and this GG force function, I really like a lot. Um, so it shows the hazard ratio for the different predictors. Um, and this is actually, and like this concordance index thing, I didn't find it easy to get this concordance index from just like the output of like, like here you see the output of this Cox model. Oh, oh it does say concordance. Oh, I missed that before. Um, yeah, but in this GG force thing, you know, it, it, um, you see the concordance index down here and then it kind of shows the, the impact of each covariate on the hazard. Uh, ratio, which is neat. So, yeah. So I don't know what my verdict on this fact is. Like, I recommend it because, like, for some things, if you have not a lot of data and you're not using tibbles, um, and yeah, in other ways it seems very buggy. So, but. It's a neat package, I think. Um, but I don't know, it, it feels like just from the exploration I did that the ML community doesn't doesn't have a ton of like investment or like awareness of some of these like survival censoring situations and it seems like it could benefit from more attention. Um, Cause I don't know, I, it, like I, as we talked about this chapter, like more and more I'm seeing situations like at work, um, uh, like we we deal with like virtual machines um, and I was thinking of doing like, like this is like a right censored kind of situation, but um, like time to, to live for like a, a machine, um, time to failure, I guess people call it. Um, and, and yeah, and then like, uh, that's that I think is really well suited for the ML and stuff that's out there in addition to the traditional kind of parametric models. Um, so like this kind of survival course would be perfect for that that kind of situation. Um, but yeah, that's basically what I have and to share any any like thoughts or ideas based on based on that. The only thing I would want to add is uh, just to say, I think it's cool that you actually had an application and I'm glad that you were able to share it with us. That was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I, oh, I did yeah, have I a agree. question for I did have a question oh, yeah, for on. you. Did you find yeah. like, did you find some other like, is there like a book size reference on this kind of thing out there? Or mm -hmm. is it just pieces in, I mean, since you were using or having to use this tool, I was wondering if you ran into anything more in depth. Yeah. So My, the best slide. I haven't uh, I haven't done a lot yeah. of like I didn't look at any books. Um, this um, I came yeah. across a lot of uh, like um, what's the website that's not Stack Overflow but for statistics. Um, Stack uh, Exchange. Stack Exchange, yeah. Um, there are a lot of really helpful answers there. Um, like I kept on I was going this loop where I was like, okay, mm, like these yeah. talks models are like semi-parametric i wonder if there's like some non-parametric version mm -hmm. of this the situation for like this repeated observations with interval censoring like that's a very particular intersection and i kept on going to these posts and like everyone would say well what you're doing sounds interesting but you should just use a cox proportional hazards model <laughs> and i was like oh all right all right i'll i'll, I'll do it then you know i kept on <laughs> going back um because like i saw that performance and i was like 0.56 or whatever and i was like this this i think it could be better i don't know exactly why like like maybe there just isn't a lot of signal here but uh i thought maybe you know like maybe a more flexible model would, would be um be interesting so yeah i don't know i i uh this is i i would say that this is like one of the best summaries of like what's out there uh this this chart here um 
but like I don't like I haven't seen anything where someone's like you know I'm using evasion network for survival analysis like I haven't I haven't seen that out there so I don't know if some of these are more like theoretical like they could be used but um, probably they're paper level things right yeah um yeah I did see there was a R package uh called uh on for interval censoring uh, it's like interval censoring uh forest and it's from a paper um yeah these interval censored recursive forests so the package is icrf um but i noticed that it seems like it's only it's not used for this repeated individual uh kind of clustering uh type situation it's only really for um situations where you have some interval but it's like one one sample per person i think uh just from like I read through this paper a little bit um, and kind of tried to make sense of what it's useful for. Um, so this was, like, I guess, one caveat, but it wasn't, it still wasn't like meant for the type of data in terms of that repeated within individual sampling um, that I have, but. It does seem like, I mean, Cox pH is you know, like I said, I mean, they try more flexible things, but it seems pretty flexible, pretty uh, yeah. understandable, I guess is another thing, right? It's pretty yeah. it's relatively straightforward to understand what is going on. And then you can do this strata thing to get a bit, which I just learned about from you, to get a bit more flexibility mm -hmm. with not, you know, kind of two different uh, baseline hazards, mm -hmm. which is kind of, or maybe more, I don't know. It's kind of neat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um... I think I think maybe the only yeah. other answer is like what I was finding in the, some of those posts where people are like, you could do like a neural network on this, but you would just have to like create the right loss function. And I don't, mm -hmm. I would not know where to start for that. <laughs> um, um, yeah, it seems but, overly uh, complicated and hard to do it that way. To me, I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, the Cox models are, I think, are amazing. Like you said, the interpretability is a huge part of it. Like, it's as, as interpretable, you know, as linear regression, um, but is meant for, like, a survival context, and you get these nice curves, you know, for each, for each, um, you know, level of your uh, different predictors and et cetera. So, yeah, it's pretty neat. I mean, um, like one thing, I guess one more thing, sorry. Um, so when you do these Cox models, you can you can uh, enter the data as like uh, time one, start, time two. And then like, if you have an, another, so it's like a person time zero to time one, then the next observation is time start at one to two or like two to one to four or whatever. Like it's, it's um, so it's like this time one, time two kind of setup, but you can also do it where there's just one time variable like it's like zero three five seven nine and like what i what i was kind of confused about is if that's different if it's doing a different estimation um for that situation um like i think it might be because the papers some of the papers i read like distinguish between these those two kinds of events um those two times of data sets uh, where you have like one is like you have repeated observations for like a person, but it's it's just like one time column where it's like this event at this time, then this time, then this time, um, and and you can feed that into a Cox model uh, uh, as well. But then um, yeah, and then and then you have this this kind of data where it's where it's time one, time two, um, you know, like a left and right kind of uh, situation. So. Anyway, I, yeah, that was another aspect that I was, I'm still trying to figure out, like, if those are equivalent models. Um, I don't know if you guys thoughts on that, but. Um, so what's that random survival force thing you have on your, that Python scikit-learn thing, huh? Yeah, that was what I Random survival force sounds like a dangerous place. <laughs> yeah, I mean, these are all forests these are all, that way. <laughs> yeah, it seems interesting. I want to I want to try it out. Honestly, I want to try it out for um, they have it in R2. I want to try it out for um, for this, like the thing I was talking about with this um, time to failure kind of model. Uh, but it's it's, a, it's meant for a right censored uh, data set, right sense, right censored situation. Oh, okay. Data. Um, 
So I was like looking through this stuff and I was like, oh, there's got to be like an interval or like a sensor type argument. Like I just want to type in interval, you know, and mm -hmm. um, but but it's uh, yeah, I, I don't know if he even says here, but let's see. Uh, yeah, it doesn't even say here, but um, um but yeah, they have like interesting things, like, gradient boosted survival analysis. Um, so yeah, so there's like a little bit of ML, but it's all like uh, right sensor focused. Kevin, so. I guess I do have a question before I confuse myself in what you were saying. So with the yeah. Cox proportional hazards model, you say that these are repeated observations, say for an individual, right? But these are mm -hmm. repeated observations of like whatever event, right? Like survival time. It's not repeated observations of a predictor or any other predictors. Or so in the Cox case, it, it, it is, it is. So, um, oh, and there's two okay. kinds of predictors you can have. You can have time varying covariates where like, um, let's say like, uh, you know, in the child losing their teeth kind of case, I don't know, maybe you have a covariate that's like, that's like uh, their height or something, all right? The height okay. at each visit. Um, mm -hmm. And you could, you could have that alongside as like a predictor for like when they're gonna lose their tooth um, but, um, but you imagine you have like, you see them maybe for, you see them five times and like the first four times they still have their tooth and you record all that data. And then the fifth time they lose, they said they lost their tooth in between the last time you saw them in this time. Um, does that make sense? So, like, but you could also have a characteristic like, uh, about that person, like, um, that doesn't change, like that's static. Like you could have something that's like, uh, they're uh i don't know they're uh I don't, i'm not sure like like the socioeconomic uh status of like their family or something like maybe that doesn't change as, as frequently or like maybe just set it from the beginning of the study um and so you could have like a com like one of the other or a combination of those uh variables here um, so so this is what i mean here so like you could have you could fit a model like this where you just have time and status um mm -hmm. So here you have like, uh, and uh, so they have sex here as a um, X and sex as a, as predictors. Um, mm -hmm. And then and then you have, can have another situation here where you have starting and stopping and um, some kind of event. And because like I was thinking like you could reformat a data set like this to make mm -hmm. it uh, long um, and, and just like associate um, the event with like, the upper end of that of like the time so like if you were to make it long you would have like each of these start and stops like on top of each other just like stack um and i don't know i i don't know if that's like in terms of this cox model if that's actually the same um fit or if it's like if it understands that you mean that like that event actually didn't happen at that time but it happened between the last two time steps um but I don't know. I was I was mostly doing this because I I knew for sure that that what that meant. You know, I knew that this is right. it's like this event is within this interval. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so. Okay. Huh. Okay, that's interesting. I was just thinking in terms of um, analogous situation in a regression case, right, um, mm -hmm. where you don't have like censored data. Um, so generally, if you have, and this might be slightly, you know, like tangential, but um, when you have repeated measures, um, you know how normally you, if you're comparing different things, this is like very traditional statistics, like T-tests mm -hmm. or ANOVAs, right? Mm -hmm. So ANOVA is for more than two groups. Um, if you have within subject measurements, like for example, right, you have someone where you're doing before and after a treatment, that's two time mm -hmm. points in one individual. And so in that case, you would use a, with a repeated measures ANOVA instead of just yep. the normal ANOVA, right? Because yep. it gives you a little bit more power. So I, I'm just wondering if this is, so whatever the Cox proportional hazards model does accounts for those types of, um, I guess it's, it's, it would be like decreasing variability because it's within subject, right? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I think when you have the, so like I, you can, I think that, I think it, and this may be the difference in the, okay. in this, um, so in this, or whatever, it might not be in, in this first 
with syntax, but like in mm -hmm. general, I think you can have a Cox proportional hazards model where like you have repeated observations and you don't. Like I think there are both cases um, that are mm -hmm. possible. Like I think actually in these two examples up here on this page, it's it's just one observation per individual, and either you have an interval and you like you have an interval and like you have an event or no event, but like it's just one for that person. Um, and um, or you or you have like a you know infinite upper bound or something like you don't know when when the event ends um, or when the interval ends. Um, but like down here they have they have a situation. It's, I don't know. It's hard to see here, but it says. Uh, Fit a stratified model clustered on patients. And so you supply this like cluster equals ID argument. Um, and that takes care of the fact that like it's uh, repeated, um, repeated within a person, uh, within mm -hmm. the subject. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, and I don't know that much beyond yeah. that, but uh, but like when you have data like that with the Cox proportional hazards, I think you generally will identify it as like a cluster, like, you know, say whatever variable represents that like uh, cluster, you know, uh, designation, like you, you would supply it there. And then the model, I guess, like accounts for that aspect of the, of the, of the data or variance or, or I'm not really sure how, how it's doing. Right, right, okay. Okay, but, I think I, I understood that. So good, yeah. um, good to know that that exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Good old Cox proportional hazards, I guess. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, maybe this person needs uh, some support, more open source contributions. Um, anyway, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, sorry, it was a while for me to share stuff, but I think that's pretty much all I have. Um, no, that was cool, actually. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good stuff. Um, okay, well, I guess, do we have anything else to discuss? Um, anyone want to talk about any exercises or? I'm good. I have uh, covered not, this pretty I, well. <laughs> yeah, I have a, almost have a feeling that maybe um, this will become bigger like you're saying kevin like where you're starting mm -hmm. to find more scenarios and other I, I wonder if it's sort of like i don't know like a topic not topic but you know like dependent on specific applications like i've mm -hmm. not seen it used like for me at least you know um other than outside of like actual survival meaning like you generally like pan cancer patients or whatnot you know what i mean um yeah i did do it once when we were testing um hierarchies and rats so you put rats mm -hmm. in a tube and then they have to you know either push the other rat out so there's a time to you know i guess resolve yeah. that dominance and so that's right centered because sometimes they do and sometimes they don't and then the latency is important and mm -hmm. so we did it as a survival analysis like you know whichever group did it faster tended to have better established dominance hierarchies or whatever you know but that was mm -hmm. just very like simple like basic kaplan meyer curve um mm -hmm. and other than that i yeah i haven't seen it other than in the context of like cancer studies yeah yeah that, i mean i feel that feels like the the original like context for the development of this kind of model um yeah. which i think you're right is like why it's called survival analysis but i think the generalized form the generalized way people talk about it is like time to event and so and I think that conception of it like opens up a lot of different possibilities like I think at least for me it helps me see other opportunities um for using it you know like, yeah 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 so that's what I'm wondering if you know people will also start seeing this and say like hey you know mm -hmm. we could actually analyze it in this way so yeah I I to me it kind of it, it reminds me of um there's like a really big like interest now in like causal inference. And I think for a long time, those techniques were like within the academic and like economics, like uh, kind of context or epidemiology, like all these disciplines that use, need like observational, uh, um, you know, with observational data, getting estimates of like causal effects. And, mm -hmm. um, and then like, 
the industry and like different people interested in ML started realizing the value of like causal inference. And then there's there's been like in the last like 10 years, a huge surge in like deep learning and different, different, you know, machine learning techniques to deal with these causal situations. Mm -hmm. And um, to me, like, it feels like maybe survival analysis is like, it, it's like, it's a kind of what, what that set of techniques was for causal inference, like uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago. And like, in terms of people who are, who are in more in the ML side of things, like picking up on the problem that this is solving and mm -hmm. trying to extend it, extend it with some of the, you know, like ML techniques that we have um, yeah. out there. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. it feels like a similar thing to me. Right, um, right, right. And I, and I really do want to look up like, uh, Ron, you mentioned at the beginning, like finding a text that covers it like in a full way. Like I, I'm definitely uh, kind of, uh, definitely hungry for that kind of thing too because yeah i don't know it, it 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 seems like it's a it requires a deep treatment um to really understand it uh well and yeah it'd be great yeah, to have a book i did do a quick google search i mean there's like a ton of books out there i guess so mm. i don't know if any of them are any good and but they do exist yeah um many many of them are spring of verlog but <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah i mean and, and and like i think it is like like um i think the other place sorry and we can end but the other place um i think people talk a lot about it is um in in uh like a subscription kind of business context uh, yeah. right right so customer churn right exactly yeah yeah um and this is the exact right technique for that as well um but yeah um yeah cool. incredibly incredibly useful i think but um i think we have a lot to learn <laughs> at least i do so next week is sandra i think you're doing it is me yeah i'm excited unsupervised yeah learning right I feel lawyer, like right? finally the chapters that are <laughs> ultra relevant to what I got to do at the very end. <laughs> so should be good. Nice. Nice. Well, I'm looking yeah. forward to that. Uh, thanks. And then we'll have, oh, you, you have two, oh, you have both of the. the I have both two. because um, that whole unsupervised, uh, you know, like learning is very relevant in like uh, gene expression and like high throughput studies like, you know, transcriptomics, any other kind of stuff for clustering genes and sort of inferring function from similarity. And then also like what regulatory networks might be involved. Okay. And then the multiple testing thing is uh, also very relevant because when you look at, um, for example, gene expression studies, right? And you wanna see genes that are changing between say like a control and you've applied a drug to a different group, right? Um, oftentimes you're looking at thousands of genes and de to determine significance, you're running thousands of like, you know, hypothesis tests. And so the rate of false positives just shoots way up. So you need methods to control that for them to actually be relevant and non like spurious findings. And so um, I know this sort of at a, you know, like kind of conceptual level, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what the book has to, you know, describe in terms of the math and get a little bit more detailed on that. So Kevin at one point mentioned, um, I'm looking at the sign up sheet, that mm -hmm. we don't necessarily have to take two weeks on both of these chapters. Yeah. But I, if you're doing both of them, I guess you can pace it how you like. I mean, if you feel if you get through the first one, and I would say I mean, it's up to you guys, but or up to Kevin, I guess, but um, if you know you want to press on immediately after that to the multiple testing or if multiple testing takes two weeks for whatever reason then just yeah you can just pace yeah. it how you want because you're doing both right yeah so sounds good to me um what i was thinking was maybe we could go through the lectures for both chapters and then do the exercises but also let me take a look at the chapters because i haven't i have not yeah. looked at sure. them so yeah me either. I mean, it, either way, I think since you're doing, like you were saying, since you're doing both of them, um, we could we could just do the first and see where we are and see 
what we want to do. If we want to do a question, you know, question week, uh, go right to the other one, you know, et cetera. I think we don't have to decide right now, I guess. Sometimes. Okay. Um, That's awesome. But, because I know that for yeah. me, it's definitely going to be very useful. Um, you guys might not find applications of this in any of your work. You know what I mean? Um, but I often um, really appreciate the discussion. So um, yeah, let's just play by ear. So I'll be presenting next week. And um, maybe I can Very also good. present some cool use cases. Yeah. Okay. Sounds that would good. be awesome. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah. Yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah. yeah, thanks for the discussion. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Uh, See you next week. All right, bye. See you next week. Bye.